No, I'm I'm not actually crying. It's just an onion. Ah, it's summertime. My favorite time of the year. Not because it's sunny all day or because school's out. No. Because of the steam summer sale. I mean, who cares if I maxed out my credit cards and ran out of money? Oh, wait a minute. I might have some cash in my wallet. Got it! Now let's... Mother f Nah, I'm just playing. I found this $5 Jamba Juice card in my wallet, so that'll get me what, like, half a smoothie? But back to it. I saw a couple YouTubers that I'm a fan of playing this game and heard nothing but good reviews, so I figured I had to give it a shot. And damn, I was just kidding about crying earlier, but this story really did give me the feels in a way that typically I only get from movies. There are so many subtleties and beautiful imagery within this game that just amplify the story. The game starts on a ferry overlooking a beautiful scene with the text, What Remains of Edith Finch? Good question. Good thing we're holding Edith Finch's diary. Should help give some answers. We open the diary and begin to read. We hear Edith's voice as we would imagine it, because it's all through her perspective. A lot of this isn't going to make sense to you. And I'm sorry about that. I'm just gonna start at the beginning with the house. As we read, the text gives way to a scene. Much like a child letting their imagination take hold when reading a story, we become sucked into the pages. The words vanish and we begin to relive Edith's story. We learn she hasn't been back since her brother Lewis's funeral, and as we explore further, we constantly receive bite-sized lines of the diary in an engaging and unobtrusive way, on a tree or in a path, breaking apart as we walk through them. Edith has come back to her childhood home in search of answers since her mother passed and left her a key. This home should have all the answers. A home that looks built in almost a manic sort of way. Wait, could it be? A house that holds all the answers? Maybe this game will reveal all the secrets to the Hello Neighbor house. <laughs> nah, that's even a bit too far-fetched for my taste. So we try the front door like a normal person. And, of course, it's locked. And the key doesn't work. What do we do now? Sneak around the side of the house and use the doggy door. Duh. The inside of the house is in complete disarray. The people living here must have left in a hurry. There are dishes piled high, to-go boxes still sitting out, and a cookbook left open. And there's so much salmon. But besides the state of the house, we're also told that a lot of things got left behind in the whirlwind of that last night. So yeah, something went down. Making our way upstairs, we learned that Edith's mom sealed up all the bedrooms after her son, Milton, disappeared. But Great Grandma Edie drilled peepholes in retaliation. Now don't worry people, I know drilling peepholes to look inside people's bedrooms is typically pretty creepy. Although, so is sealing up people's bedrooms in the first place. Um, well... If it's any consolation, at least everyone who lives in those bedrooms are dead. Yeah, that sounded a lot better in my head. Um, that's still pretty creepy. But yeah, the reason why this house is so large is because each bedroom belonged to a different family member shown on this family tree. And each of the rooms got sealed, except for Great Uncle Walter's, which, coincidentally, has nothing in it but a book and a lock. Well, the lock is on the book, but you see what I'm saying. And surprise, surprise, our key fits in the lock, revealing a passageway which leads to Molly's room. And here's where the inception begins. We read Molly's diary within Edith's diary and get transported yet again into the words on the page. Molly wakes up in the room, incredibly hungry from not eating dinner that night, and tries eating some dribble food, toothpaste, and some nice berries that look super safe. Then we see a bird outside the window and, since we're a badass, we plan on how we're gonna catch, kill, and consume said bird. And before you know it, we're transforming into a cat and catching that bird. Then an owl catching a bunny. Then a shark rolling down a hill? Uh, seems reasonable. Until we make it to the water and eat a seal. Okay, that's more like it. Then we're a slithering sea monster, scouring a fishing boat with a taste for human flesh, ultimately going through the sewer pipes and into Molly's room under her bed. Then we wake up as Molly, with the monster under her bed, waiting until she goes to sleep, because they both know that she will be delicious.
Now, did the sea monster take her life? Or did she die from those suspect looking berries? Or did she just hallucinate and fall out a window? Who knows, because all we know for sure is that this evening, she died. After this experience, we open the window and traverse outside and go into Great Grandma Edie's room where we see a bunch of empty bird cages. In a similar fashion to the empty rooms, each of the cages are dedicated to the birds that lived in them. Quite the strange family we've got here. We also learn that her husband, Sven, was killed by a dragon. Well, a dragon-shaped slide. Same thing. We make our way to Edie's slideshow dedicated to her father, Odin, where we find out for surezies that the Finches are haunted, and that this curse took Odin's wife and newborn son. To escape said curse, he did the rational thing of throwing his house on a boat and sailing to Washington State. The boat ultimately crashed due to 40 foot waves, sending the house and Odin to the bottom of the sea. But Edie, Sven, and Molly survived, building a new Finch house in Washington. A pretty cool house at that, but one that hasn't evaded the curse. From here we go through Edie's bathroom, which reminds me, I need to go to the carpet store after this video. One can never have too much wall carpet. From carpet bathroom, we head down another secret passageway to Calvin and Sam's room, who are two more of Edie's children. Calvin's side of the room is all roped off, but with a little maneuvering, oh, that was easy. We make it past and up the stairs to read the diary entry. But this time it isn't written by the family member himself, it is written as a eulogy by Sam for his brother. Calvin had always wanted to do what many children envisioned, swing all the way around. A feat which most kids are too scared to even attempt. But after their sister Barbara's funeral, Sam and Calvin promised each other that they wouldn't be scared anymore. So Calvin made up his mind to do it. The wind picked up, giving him the much needed boost to go over the top. But he lost control and flew toward the ocean and onto the rocks below. And that was the day, the day he made up his mind to fly. And he did. From here, we make our way to another secret passage. This one disguised in a bookshelf, leading us into Barbara's room. Barbara is the child star of the family, playing the lead role in the movie My Friend Bigfoot. And her story is told not through a diary, but through a comic book. Barbara was famous for her scream, but as she grew older, she found it difficult to adapt to life away from stardom, being described in the comic as a washed up has-been. She was asked to perform her signature scream at a convention, but it hadn't aged well. After her father had to go to the ER, she was forced to skip that convention to watch her brother, Walter. In the background on the TV, we hear about a gang of masked hoodlums, led by the infamous hookman killer, Dr. Carl Hamill. We hear Walter scream upstairs and go check it out, only to be greeted by Dr. Carl. Using some swift maneuvering, Barbara is able to throw him off the second story. But when she went downstairs to check on him further, he had vanished. She wandered through the house, only to hear, and that the horror fans had shown up to hear her scream in person. Kinda weird, but just roll with it. But that same night, she was murdered. The police blamed her boyfriend, Rick, but he also disappeared that night. Did he kill her? Or was it Dr. Carl? Or maybe one of the fans? All we know for sure is that her body was never found, except for her ear in the music box downstairs. From here we go downstairs and use the music box key to get into the basement, where we open up a refrigerator and head down into some sort of Bunker? That's what it looks like. This is where Walter hid himself after that traumatizing experience. Not that I blame him. He was trying to hide from the family curse after all. Reading his note, we learn that he had been down in this bunker for 30 years, living a lonely life away from the rest of the family, settling into a routine of dealing with earthquakes and eating canned food at exactly 12 o'clock. But after doing this for 30 years, he experienced a random week of no earthquakes. At this point, Walter decided to leave. He broke out of his bunker and into a tunnel because no reason to use the entrance, only to be greeted by a bright light and the smack of a train. A train which had been out of commission for a week. A train which rumbled the ground at 12 o'clock every day. From here we go out and along the train tracks, over to the beach and up to the Finch's cemetery, where we look out and can see the ruins of Odin's old house. Then we go back down toward the house, you know, the one on land, and climb into the trees, learning that Edith is currently 22 weeks pregnant. Damn girl, probably not the best idea to be climbing and stuff, but who cares when you got a family curse to deal with, am I right? From this climbing, we get to Edith's grandpa Sam's room. If you remember, Sam is the brother who wrote the eulogy for Calvin. Here we're taken to the past through a series of photographs. Sam and Don, Edith's mother, go on a camping trip where Don hunts a deer. 
After shooting it, they are in the process of taking a picture when the deer bucks a little bit and throws Sam off the cliff and to his death. A story which really hits home for Edith because it's one her mom never chose to share. The next part of our story comes from a note on a divorce contract between Sam and his then wife Kay. It tells the story of a happy baby, Gregory, who loved playing in the tub and would get lost in his imagination. After Kay and Sam were arguing on the phone, Gregory was left alone in the tub and through his childish imagination, he imagined himself as a frog and swam and swam in the water until he drowned. Now Don's other sibling, Gus, lived until he was 13. His story is told through a poem from Don. Sam was getting remarried and Gus was taking it pretty hard. He was sad and moping around and chose to fly his kite instead of partaking in the festivities when a storm broke out. It began to pick up tables and chairs and other debris and became more and more violent until eventually some hit and killed him. After this, Dawn moved up into the loft as an escape from the room she lived in with her deceased brothers. This is where we learn that Edith's father passing away was the reason why Dawn moved with her children back to the Finch house in the first place. The house had to get bigger to accommodate the new children, so they just added more rooms, bringing us to Milton's castle. Milton loved to paint and on his desk is a foot book to tell his story. A story where he is painting with a magic paintbrush and paints a door. A door which he walks through and the book ends, which parallels his mysterious disappearance. And while this is a bit outside the realm of Edith's comprehension, it is worth noting that the developer, Giant Sparrow, is alluding here that Milton is part of their first game, The Unfinished Swan. Creative director Ian Dallas even said, Milton is the king, not the protagonist in The Unfinished Swan and that he considers it canon to the Giant Sparrow universe. So if Milton did actually draw himself into another realm, it starts to raise some questions about the other deaths. Did Molly literally shapeshift into those animals? Did she actually die? Or did she just turn into an animal? And what about Barbara? Since all that was found was her ear, could something else have happened? Maybe Giant Sparrow has some tricks up their sleeve in the future. But from here we head out of the castle and onto Lewis's ship, his psychedelic man cave. Lewis seems like quite the swell fellow. We're told Lewis' story through a letter from his psychiatrist to his mother, Dawn. We learn that after Milton went missing, Lewis became a shut-in and began abusing drugs. Shortly after, he became clean and started seeing a psychiatrist, which helped, but it also made him comprehend the daily monotony of his life at the salmon cannery. He began to let his mind wander, seeing himself as an adventurer in a labyrinth, and slowly expanding and becoming more and more in-depth with his daydream. And while his mind wandered, his work improved. He became a model employee in the real world, and mayor of Lewistopia in his mind. He explored further and further, conquering lands and finding love. But in the real world, he drifted farther and farther away, even forgetting to go home one evening. But he just kept going. Then he arrived at the Golden Palace and began seeing his imagination self as the real Lewis, not the one chopping salmon. He was crowned king of the land. All he had to do was bend down and accept his crown. Lewis's death was the last straw for Edith's mother. After the funeral, she told Edith to pack her bags and leave. We see the open boxes and messiness of the house as we make our way up to Edith's room, where we sit on the bed and are told the rest of the story through Edith's pen. Edie and Don fought a lot about leaving. Edie didn't want to leave, but Don had the death of two children and the curse fueling her fire. They were still fighting when Edith snuck into the library and picked up Edie's History of the Finches book, a book written to Edith a book about the sad, unlucky tale of the Finch family. A book which, unfortunately, Dawn ripped from Edith before she was able to finish. Because in Dawn's eyes, the curse was only happening through these stories. Without them, she hoped, the curse would just go away. So Dawn took Edith away, never to see her great-grandmother again. Years later, Dawn got sick, then got better, then didn't. And then Edith was alone, the last member of the Finch family, until she learned she was pregnant. And that is who the diary is written for. The journal is written for her child, with the words shown as blood cells as we experience this child being born. She wanted to tell all these stories herself, but never got the chance, as she died during childbirth. And that's where the story ends, with her son as the last member of the Finch family, overlooking her grave in the house that is ingrained in this family's DNA. And for how thought-provoking and emotional this story is, the takeaway is just as powerful. If we lived forever, Maybe we'd have time to understand things. But as it is, I think the best we can do is try to open our eyes. And appreciate how strange and brief all of this is. Life is short. 
Be happy for what you have, appreciate it, and make the best of your time on this earth, because who knows how long it's gonna last. The only thing we know for sure is how strange and crazy everything can be. It can sometimes be disheartening, but don't be sad. Just be amazed that any of us ever had a chance to be here at all. Now for those of you who haven't had a chance to play the game yet, I'd highly recommend picking it up. This video really doesn't do the storytelling of the game justice, and it's probably my favorite game so far this year. Now if you have any other recommendations of games that I should play, definitely let me know in the comments down below, and who knows, maybe I'll make a video on it. And as always, thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you all next time. Toodles!